Good morning. Good morning, everyone here in person and everyone everywhere who is also worshiping with us online today. And welcome to Homer United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Lisa, and here in Homer, we live on the unceded ancestral land of the Sukpiak and Dena'ina peoples. I'm grateful for their continued care and stewardship of this land. And I'm also grateful this week of summer solstice for the land itself, the waters, and the abundance that they contain. Let us be in joyful and healing relationships with all of creation. If you are worshiping online today, I invite you to take a moment to like the video and say good morning in the comments, and be sure you let us know if you have any special prayer requests. And for you who are in person, thank you for continuing to follow our safety protocols. Uh, Tourist season is hitting Homer pretty hard, and there's been a lot of people who have uh, been sick lately, so please be sure that you're taking care of yourself and being cautious, not just here, but wherever you're going around town, and be sure you're protecting your health and our community communities as well. I'm so glad to be back with you this week. Thank you for your prayers. Uh, Thankfully, I just had the flu last week, nothing uh, more serious than that, and I am really grateful that Peggy was able to step in at the last minute and be here with you. We have just completed the annual conference, a week-long Greater Northwest Annual Conference season. As the director of Connectional Ministries of the Alaska Conference, one of my primary responsibilities this time of year is to plan and organize the annual conference. I work closely with the bishop and the other DCMs, as well as our superintendents and all the various committees of our conference who present reports and petitions. I am really grateful to all of those all around the conference who make this possible, especially our Alaska Conference lay leader, Joanne Hayden, who many of you know through her uh, presence and work with United Women in Faith, and uh, our conference administrative assistant, Crystal Feaster, who's Joanne's daughter, who also is really active uh, in the United Methodist Women group, and so uh, they both have uh, done an incredible amount of work making this season happen. Uh, Crystal, in particular, is the one who's in charge of chasing down all the reports and putting together the 80-plus page pre-conference handbook and addendum and sending out all the links and emails and reminders so that everybody shows up at the right place at the right time, and if you've ever done that behind-the-scenes kind of administrative work, you know how difficult that can be. Annual conference is the time that we join together for work and for worship. And since we are part of an area, there are lots of moving parts. We, as the Alaska Conference, have sister conferences, the Oregon, Idaho, and the Pacific Northwest Conference, and we are presided over by a single bishop, Bishop Elaine. And so together we're called the Greater Northwest Conference. We did as much of our worship and business together as we could and split into different groups just for our conference-specific work, like approving budgets and equitable compensation for pastors and other petitions that were specific for each conference. Since this is an annual conference, this is our one big event each year, today you're going to hear about how some of the Methodist sausage is made, like how the petitions come together and what are some of the things that actually happened at annual conference, some of the business that we did. Uh, You'll hear reflections today from Ruby Nofziger, who is your lay member to annual conference. She is the person from our church who has a vote in annual conference. Each clergy person has their uh, lay person, so every church has two votes. So your votes come from me and from Ruby, and she will share uh, her reflections with you. And I've invited Dave to share as well, since he also attended alongside Ruby. And I will share with you also some actions that were taken and some of my overall impressions from this week long conference together. The liturgy throughout our service today, I took from our worship services this past week during annual conference so that you can hear some bits and pieces of what worship was like as over 800 uh, Methodists from around the greater Northwest gathered together in person and virtually in order to worship God together and to speak with a united voice. I invite you to stand as you're able for our call to worship. You will see uh, the responses printed in bold in the bulletin, or they will also be on your screen if you are worshiping at home. Friends, as the Spirit comes like a wind, may we gather with open hearts. Whatever is distracting us in this moment, we let go of it and give it to God for safekeeping. May we be one people that stays wide awake in our faith. 
May we keep alert. May we be brave. May we do all things with love. And may God's spirit and presence dwell within us. Amen. I invite you to continue to stand as you're able. Uh, Our opening song today is uh, actually one that for probably the first time ever, we did not sing at annual conference. This is a uh, good old uh, Methodist tune, and Are We Yet Alive, written by Charles Wesley in 1749. And this is often one that is shared during annual conference season as people join together and remember that we are alive in service to God. We will sing... uh, This is on page 553. Most of you already found it in your hymnal. The lyrics will also appear on your screen at home. We'll sing verses 1 through 4 today. You may be seated. The prayer of illumination. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, and meet us where we are. Embark upon us like a dove. Draw us together to be alert to your presence. Call us to attendance and assure us of your grace. Bring us into connection, O God, so that we may witness your peace. May we be the just and caring community that you are nurturing in in this world. Amen. Stand, please, for the reading of the scripture. This is from 1 Corinthians 16, verses 13 and 14. Stay awake, stay firm in your faith, be brave, be bold. Everything should be done in love. Word of God, word of life. You may be seated. I'd like to invite the children to come forward to join me for a few minutes together. Hello, hello. Ooh, that sounds awfully loud under my mask. How about turning it down just a touch? Hi there, and I see Elowen and Bjorn coming too. Hi. Good morning. He's working on it. Those steps are steep for little legs. Hi. <laughs> hello. So several weeks ago now, we did a little exercise, and for some of you, you'll remember this, and for some, it will be new. Um, We are going to uh, also test the memory of the congregation. So a bunch of weeks ago now, we talked about what different groups of animals are called. Do you remember this? We talked about different groups of animals. 
children of the church of all ages. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we'll see how many of these you remember because we have a new word we're going to learn today that's related to this. What is a group of chickens called? If there's a bunch of chickens together, what are they called? A flock of chickens. What sound do chickens make? Can you do a chicken sound? I can do a chicken sound. A flock of chickens. How about a bunch of cows? What is a group of cows called? That's what they say, moo. A herd of cows says moo. How about wolves? What are a bunch of wolves called when they all hang out together? A pack of wolves, and they howl, don't they? I love it. How about lions? What sound do lions make? Very good. What is a bunch of lions together called? Did you say it? A pride of lions. Good. Ooh, and here's a good one. We have a lot of these out in the bay. What are a bunch of fish called? When they all swim together, they're called a school. Very good. Now, what sound do fish make? (laughs) Blub, blub, blub. (laughs) And let's do one more. How about sheep? What's a group of sheep called? It's just like chickens. A flock. And what do sheep say? Yeah, very good. So these are called collective nouns or words that describe a group of things. And if, oh, what about that one? What about geese? What are a group of geese called? A, a gaggle of geese. What do goose, gooses do, geese do? Honk, honk. Squawk, squawk. What about this one? What about dolphins or whales? What is a group of them called? We see those in the bay sometimes, too. A pod. A pod of whales. What sounds do whales make? I don't know. I don't know what sound whales make. And big splashes when they breathe, right? So these are names for groups of animals. And several weeks ago I said we've got a name for groups of Christians that we call them a church. That this building is called a church building but the people who are in it are called the church. There's another word that we use for it too which is a conference which is a bunch of churches together are called a conference in the Methodist tradition. So groups of Christians are called churches, and groups of churches are called conferences. And this week, we got to meet together with conferences from Oregon and Idaho and Washington and Alaska. I think at least one family here has family in Oregon, right? (gasps) Have you been to Oregon? I know. Oh, I think maybe. Do we have family in Oregon? Yes, we do. Portland. I think you've been to Portland before. I've seen pictures. Yeah. So we gathered together as a conference, a collection of churches and peoples in order to worship God together. So let's say a prayer thanking God for giving us this chance to worship. Dear God, thank you for letting us worship. Thank you for showing us how to love each other. Help us be kind and peaceful people. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming up today. You make great animal sounds. Thank you. Ruby, I'd invite you to come up to share your reflections today. Keep alert, stand firm in your faith, be courageous, be strong, let all you do be done in love. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 to 14. This is the whole theme of the conference. In her last last Episcopal address, Bishop Elaine, I think, actually did that as she spoke about some controversial topics. The ministers of the church have been focused in on priorities like COVID-19, 
like pastors who had to learn technology quickly so that they could keep their flocks together. Many people within the conference were handing out food to people and doing other acts of mercy. The volcanic eruption in Tonga in January was a focus of our giving at the conference this year. Bishop Elaine said that the Methodist missionaries went to Tonga in 1822 and were well received. And missionaries came to the Northwest in 1835 and were less well received. So she said that Tonga people are our elders. She showed in a video of a Tongan church in Portland who along with their neighbors and friends were filling a whole cargo box of clothing, food, and water to take to friends, families, and communities in Tonga. She also spoke about gun violence and highlighted a church who was having every member as well as recruiting other people to write to their legislators, requesting them to enact some gun laws. The Alaska Conference also wrote a petition as a group to enact gun laws too. She also spoke about the hatred within our society, white supremacy, gun violence, and falsehoods that are perpetuating. She said not to bear false witness against one another, for that is a sin. Instead, she said, be a peacemaker, do no harm, be responsible for one another. The truth will set you free. Stay awake, stand firm, be brave, be strong, and do everything in love. There will be some changes in our churches in Alaska this year. Fortunately, Pastor Lisa will continue to be our pastor and will continue her role as our part pastor three-fourths time and as the director of connectional ministry role the other one-fourth time. Carlo will be the full-time assistant to the bishop, and he was nominated by the delegation to discern if he is called to be a bishop. Bishop Elaine will retire at the end of the year, and there will be a new bishop. Christine Dowling Soka is our new superintendent for the Alaska Conference. I was surprised at how many people from our church have died this year and of course were mentioned at the memorial service. Al Clymer, Will Files, Cherry Jones, Nancy Levingston, Daryl Walker, and Fred Yenny. I must say I much prefer being there in person than going by Zoom to a conference because the relationships that I have with people are, in, are an important part of the conference. In the closing worship of the conference, which was Saturday evening, after I finished writing this, Bishop Elaine said one more thing that I would like to share with you all. <laughs> I was afraid of this would <laughs> We are all Beloved children of God, and God is pleased with us. Even though Jesus had not done any of his works yet, just as he was baptized, God said, with you I am well pleased. You are beloved child of God, and I'd like you to all say it with me. I am a beloved child of God. God is well pleased with me. Say it with me. I am a beloved child of God. God is well pleased. You are empowered by the Holy Spirit to bring justice and to embody mercy. I'm sorry. <laughs> I too am delighted 
that Pastor Lisa was reassigned here and will be with us for another year. <clears throat> Annual conference is an awesome experience. It's a chance to become aware of what other churches and organizations in Alaska are doing. It's also the place to perform the needed administrative dis decision-making and financial planning for the good of the church and its mission. This conference seemed remarkable to me in the amount of agreement shown in the voting. Uh, most ballots passed with more than 80% uh, in favor. Many of them were uh, unanimous. I thought the conference this year had an extra sense of change and uncertainty. The personnel changes that Ruby mentioned probably contributed to that. Another source of change and uncertainty is the formation of the Global United Methodist Church as a separate denomination from the United Methodist Church. The 2020 General Conference of the United Methodist Church was delayed due to COVID. It is now planned for 2024. This has delayed important decisions related to the new denomination, but also related to Alaska becoming a mission district of the General Conference. However, the Alaska and Pacific Northwest uh, conferences are moving together toward our joining PNW as a mission district as was proposed and was on the agenda for the 2020 conference. That cooperation is going very well as witnessed by Alaska personnel as well as Pacific Northwest personnel. After seven hours of meeting on Monday, Carlo gave his final address as a superintendent and highlighted goals and achievements of the past eight years. Following that was a video. The link to the whole service is, can be found in the latest Unto You publication that we have. And you can also fast forward to about the seven hour point. And if you are quick and you're looking, you might find yourself saying, thank you, Pastor Carlo, as we as a church thanked him for his service. For me personally, the outstanding part of the conference this year was the Episcopal address by Bishop Elaine. I listened to it on Sunday and at least three times since. The common phrase she used was intersection of differences. My mind focused on intersections, especially those in roads. I realized that intersections are good in that they allow me to go to the post office or to see friends, someplace that I choose. Elaine spoke of the intersections we have with people the people of Tonga who had great needs following the tsunami and intersections with the church in Portland who is sending them food and has already sent them a truckload. She challenged us to intersect with the people of Tonga and Portland by joining them and supporting that work financially. These are positive interactions and intersections of difference. But intersections also have potential danger. You know that in the highway, whenever we have intersections. Elaine spoke of current conflicts growing out of racism, white supremacy, hatred, murder, religion, nationality, and our understanding of truth as examples of intersections of differences. 
although confronting these differences may be dangerous, we dare not ignore them. We're told to stay alert, stand firm in the face of disruption, be brave, and act in love to care for all of God's children. May the wisdom, power, and love of Jesus guide us into new conversations in these areas. We never uh, talk ahead of time to say who's going to say what, so I'm going to skip around in my notes a little bit so I'm not repetitive. Uh, after uh, six long days, there are so many things that I could tell you about annual conference. I could tell you the epic joke that is a quarter-time position during this exhausting season of preparations and meetings. I could tell you the utter frustration of trying to get clergy and laity to answer their emails and write their reports when all they want to do is be outside enjoying this glorious Alaska summer. I could tell you that when stressed out and past their deadlines, sometimes Christians aren't. I could tell you about the particular look the bishop gets on her face when she is surprised by late-breaking petitions. I could tell you about the sheer complexity of the behind-the-scenes technological work to pull off a four-state hybrid in-person and online conference that includes petitions, motions, seconds, amendments, and votes in three separate conferences all in the same Zoom room. I could tell you about the 11-page agenda that contained 26 presenters, 16 videos, 25 petitions, reports, and actions, 42 PowerPoint slides, and three awards, and that was for the Alaska Conference Day alone. Friends, I could tell you that trying to get through last weekend and the earlier part of the week while fighting the flu was no fun. I could tell you about all the lessons that I learned and all the things that I will definitely be doing differently last, uh, next year. But instead of focusing on all of those things, I want to focus on those things that brought me joy over the course of this last week. I will write up the worky work stuff and put it in Tuesday's newsletter so that you can see the reports and the actions and the petitions that were taken. Uh, you've heard the newsletter mentioned a couple times now. If you don't receive that, uh, please talk to me or Savannah after the service because we do try to put more of the technical information in there so that you can read it in your own time and have some time to think about it and digest it. Well, talking about my joys, my joy uh, started before annual conference even began. A couple of weeks before annual conference, we had a pre-conference information session. It was the first time we've done this in Alaska, but since we were meeting online and the webinar format can be a little alienating, it's not an interactive kind of format, you don't get to see each other's faces, we held a pre-conference session that was open to anybody from the state of Alaska who wanted to log in and ask questions about the reports, they could talk to the people who wrote the legislation and have their questions answered. And about 50 people from around the state logged into this session. The vast majority were laity. And that was great joy for me because as clergy people, we are paid to read the pre-conference handbook. We are expected to show up at these conferences as part of our job. But for lay folks, you volunteer your time. You volunteer your talents in order to be part of the working of the church. And that is something that I don't want to take for granted. And it's something that gives me great joy to see how active and interested people were from all around the state. The bishop's uh, address at opening worship also struck me deeply. And in addition to those things that Dave and Ruby lifted up, uh, she also said that as Christians, we must live in ways that promote community, health, and peace. 
We must live in ways that promote community, health, and peace. She reminded us that John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, was concerned about the whole of people's lives. He was concerned about their medical needs, their educational needs, their nutrition and health and housing and work conditions. There was no part of people's lives that our faith doesn't call us to take an active role in so that the whole of people's lives will be blessed. On Monday, we did have our Alaska conference gathering, and even though we had our times of mourning and remembering those beloved among us who are now part of the great cloud of witnesses, there was also a celebratory nature of we are getting together again. We are able to talk to each other and connect with each other and do the work of the church together. Um, Some of the joys came in the form of awards that were given over the course of the day. There were three awards that were given that day. There's an award called the One Matters Award. One Matters. And it is awarded to a church that went from zero baptisms the year before to one baptism last year. And we use our statistical tables and sort through uh, all the reports that we as churches make every year. And a church that was in a dry spell, that maybe had experienced a downturn, that was struggling in some way made a difference in just one person's life. And so this year, the One Matters Award was given to the United Methodist Church of Chugiak and Pastor Jim Depkin. They really struggled during the pandemic. They had far more political division in their church than we have experienced here and really went through difficult times during the pandemic. And last year, they celebrated their first baptism in two years and were uh, given that award um, as acknowledgement of the work that they've done together as a church. Another award that is given is the Outstanding Layperson of the Year, and that was uh, awarded to a deaconess in our conference named Chivi Crooks. Chivi is the wife of Reverend Murray Crooks, who uh, you've heard me mention his name before. He's an Alaska Native pastor who's a church planter in Anchorage working to establish Every Nation United Methodist Church. Chivi is a deaconess, which is a lay order in the Methodist Church. It means a person who feels called to dedicate their life to ministry but not as an ordained pastor. They want to live out their ministry in their everyday life and work. Uh, We have... um Uh, deaconesses who uh, run food pantries. We have a home missioner, which is the male version of a deaconess, who is a math teacher at a high school. Uh, He lives out his faith just through his regular everyday work. And uh, Chivi does that same thing. And she was awarded the Outstanding Layperson Award. And the Harry Denman Award for Evangelism was awarded to Dave and Ruby Knopfziger. I shared the nomination form with you in last week's newsletter. Uh, The essay that I wrote and that many of our church leaders wrote, attesting to the way that they live out their faith every day. I was grateful of all the nominees that Dave and Ruby were selected for this award and recognized for their faithful service. I think, I'm going to cry talking about it. I think Ruby and I both cried (laughs) through the entire presentation. Um, It really was a blessing to have them honored by the whole conference, and I do recommend that you uh, read the the, uh, nomination form as well and uh, show them your um, gratitude also. Another tearjerker was saying goodbye to Pastor Carlo. It was one of those mixed joy and sorrow times. Carlo had access to the agenda, right? He was the superintendent while I was planning all this, so he always had my working draft, which contained a link that said, thank you, Pastor Carlo, video. (laughs) And every great once in a while, he'd send me a text message and said, I still haven't clicked the link, but I'm tempted. (laughs) And every time I'd say, don't click it. It's not for you to see yet. Uh, But I did warn him, you're going to (laughs) cry. And he did, and of course, we all did. Celebrating eight years of ministry and friendship and leadership is hard. It's hard to express the full extent of our appreciation and to really describe how we have grown as a conference under his leadership, how we have become more collaborative in the work that we do, how we have become more heart-led rather than head-led led in the way we approach ministry. 
the way we've become more inclusive of other cultures and voices, other values and other leadership styles. We've become more focused on building relationships with each other and coming to consensus in our decision making. Um, it was hard to say goodbye, and yet we did. And that led to another joy to celebrate. Um, this year, Three of our five bishops in the Western jurisdiction are retiring. This is the largest turnover in Episcopal leadership that we have ever encountered. And so we will be holding Episcopal elections in November. And the Alaska Conference nominated Reverend Carlo Rapinut as an Episcopal candidate. Not only that, the Pacific Northwest and Oregon-Idaho conferences also did. He was the only candidate affirmed by all three conferences. So over the next few months, he will be part of a discernment process Process, um, with other Episcopal nominees lifting, uh, leading up to that time of election. So I would ask you to be praying for Carlo during this time of discernment so that he can clearly hear if this is where God is calling him in his ministry next. I would also ask you to pray for guidance for our delegates as we prepare to vote for new Episcopal leaders. We who have served on the delegation, we are elected for a four-year term, and because of the delay in general conference, like Dave said, we are now in year six of our four years. So the delegation is getting tired, and yet this has revived us a little bit to be able to see one of our own raised in the Alaska conference maybe going on to lead us as a bishop. We also had the joy of welcoming Christina Dowling Soka as our new superintendent. She is a storyteller and a dynamic preacher, and I can't wait for you to get to know her and for her to get to know you. And there was morning and evening, and that was only the second day. So I won't lead you through the entire rest of the week of conference. I will say I had fewer responsibilities after our Alaska day was done. Um, there were some other joys that came up along the way as well. For example, Megan Woods was commissioned in the Pacific Northwest Conference. Like me, Megan is a homegrown Alaska pastor. She was raised in Chugiak, and she went to seminary from the same church I did, Anchor Park in Anchorage. She has now graduated from seminary and has returned to Alaska, and she will be serving Seward and Moose Pass. So uh, if you remember when I first came to Homer, I was commissioned as a provisional elder, and that's where Megan is now. She still has a couple of years of a probationary period where she will continue uh, to have conversations and her calling uh, assessed by herself and others uh, before her full ordination. So I would invite you to pray for Megan as well as she begins to serve our neighbor churches and communities here on the Kenai. Yesterday was the closing worship, and an important part of that service was a celebration of Bishop Elaine's ministry. She was originally scheduled to retire in 2020, and then the pandemic hit, and she agreed to put off retirement for a year to help us through that crisis. Then 2021 came along, and the pandemic was still there, and uh, steady leadership was still needed. And she agreed once again to put off her retirement for another year. But now she really will truly, absolutely, definitely retire at the end of 2022. She was born and raised up in Methodism through the Pacific Northwest Conference, and so it's really appropriate that this is the last place that she has served as bishop here in the greater Northwest. She speaks fondly of Alaska, our conference, and the time that she got to spend in Seward when we held annual conference there and were able to take her on a cruise of Resurrection Bay. And if you remember on that same trip, she came here after annual conference with her husband, Clint. They took a vacation in Homer, and we had a reception for her downstairs, and a lot of our community partners came to meet her and talk to her about the importance of the presence of our church in this community. And it was a really um, important lesson for her to learn about what an essential part of our community's social safety net our churches in Alaska are. Having served on Bishop Elaine's executive staff for this past year, I have seen her tiredness. I have seen her longing for rest, but I've also seen her dedication knowing that her work 
was not quite yet done. So I would invite you to pray for Bishop Elaine as she completes this last season of her ministry, drawing her service to faithful completion. Dave and Ruby both talked about the Tongan Relief Fund, so I will skip over that note. Two little last things that were really funny. So you heard how short our scripture was this year. Keep awake, be alert, be bold, stand, uh, be faithful, stand strong in the faith. It was a very short little scripture, and so it was kind of like a refrain, the whole conference and all the reports and petitions and, and addresses and everything, but something about that also tickled the bishop's funny bone. So every once in a while when she was drawing us back together after break, she'd lean over and turn on her microphone and lean forward and say, Keep awake! stand strong, be bold in your faith. And I mean, it was just so funny. She just every, and then she would giggle about it. And so just it, to me, put that scripture in a different context though, because it reminded us that this is not like some gentle, soothing scripture. Like this is an alert for us that we are to keep awake and be bold, that we are being called to be firm and faithful and to be active in our faith. And what an important message for times such as these. So the bishop was very pleased with that and every once in a while it would make us all jump in our seats when she yelled keep awake at us and then the last thing was we both started and ended the conference with a remembrance of baptism of that sacramental call to resist evil injustice and oppression in all ways they present themselves and one of my favorite pictures I've seen from an annual conference was several years ago when we gathered together in person and there's a picture of the bishop in like full fancy vestments with two handfuls of water from the baptismal font and the photographer caught her just as she was flinging these two handfuls of water out onto the congregation as part of that remembrance. And there was a similar situation at the remembrance on Saturday. There were very few people in person there was uh, just about 10 or 12 people who were there in person as support staff. All the rest of us were online. And uh, the bishop had the baptismal font in the middle, and she gave the whole liturgy of the remembrance of baptism and invited people at home to, like, dab the water and dab your forehead. And it was, you know, all very calm. And then she was like, except in here, let's get people wet, and picked up a handful of water and flung it out across the pews, trying to get to all of the people nicely socially distanced. And she did that a few times. And it was just so perfect to me, that exuberance of flinging the water around from the font as a reminder of the joyful abundance of grace that God showers down on us all. My last but maybe most important joy from this conference is that I was reappointed to serve you for another year. So we will be starting our 10th year of ministry together. And I feel greatly blessed. <sighs> I love you. I'm so glad to be here. May God bless us all as we continue to worship the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and as we love and serve our community together. Amen. I invite you uh, to stand as you're able for the gift of love. It's in our red hymnal on number uh, 408. And the words will be on your screen if you are worshiping from home. Number 408. <laughs>
may be seated. I did, through uh, the notes that I shared, lifted up several different people and situations to be in prayer for. So just a reminder to be in prayer for Pastor Carlo as he discerns a call to the Episcopacy, a prayer for delegates and other volunteers from around the state who have served for so long. Uh, One of those uh, yearly actions that we do is approve the nomination slate of all of those who serve on conference committees. And uh, for another year in a row, those same people serving were asked to, to re-up again instead of being able to rotate off because of the end of the quadrennium, which, like I said, we are now in year six of our four-year terms. And uh, so prayers for all of those volunteers who are still maintaining their faithful service, including our delegation, who is charged with the task of electing our new Episcopal leaders. I ask your prayers again for Bishop Elaine as well as she completes the last six months of her service in this way. There are lots of transitions uh, because she will no longer have clergy housing. She and her husband have had to buy a house and are figuring out uh, what does it look like to downsize when you retire and uh, move to a new community. And so all of those uh, retirement sort of decisions are things that they are having to make right now, as well as uh, wrapping up the business of the church and leaving our conference in a healthy place for the next bishop who comes in. Um, So I I lifted up those prayers as well. And uh, so let us pray together. We have been, uh, over the course of this summer, exploring different versions of the Lord's Prayer. And I wanted to share this one with you today. This is an adaptation of the Lord's Prayer that were written by the people of Great Spirit United Methodist Church, which is led by Reverend Dr. Alan Buck. Uh, Great Spirit is one of only six native ministries in the entire Northwest Conference. And uh, Dr. Alan Buck is also uh, the uh, director of the Circle of Indigenous Ministries for our area, and he is working with Alaska and the other conferences in order to increase our connections with indigenous people uh, to do things like uh, teach churches how to do land acknowledgments, to be aware of the people on whose land we are residing and worshiping, Um, coming to terms with our boarding school history as a Methodist church. So uh, his congregation, along with him, created this adaptation of the Lord's Prayer. So let's pray together. Creator, whose home is everywhere, in heaven and earth, your name is most sacred of all. Let your holy intentions for all creation become reality here and everywhere. In gratitude, we honor your gift of bread each day. Accept our acts of reconciliation for the balancing of life. Keep us from foolish decisions that benefit only ourselves. Protect us from enemies that threaten the sacred balance. Teach us to respect your power in the universe that is manifest through all creation. Amen. During this time of offering, I do want to give you a little bit more information about that Tongan Relief Fund that Dave and Ruby both referred to. Throughout the entire conference week, we had multiple opportunities as an area to donate to this fund. You remember several months ago now, there was an explosion of an underwater volcano that caused a tsunami that devastated the island of Tonga. And like the bishop reminds us, the Tongans are our Methodist elders in the faith. Uh, and there is a, it is actually... a, a Uh, diaspora culture, meaning that there are more Tongans living outside of the country than there are living in Tonga itself. And we do have Tongan fellowships throughout the greater Northwest, including one at mine and Joe's old home church, Anchor Park, which has a very active Tongan fellowship. The greater Northwest Tongan Relief Fund is now established to uh, help provide shipping 
for containers of supplies that will be going to Tonga. It is not cheap to ship things right now with supply chain issues. There is also a lack of container ships going the other directions. Uh, right now, I think the price tag is about $30,000 to ship a Connex box to Tonga. And so local congregations have been working uh, to gather supplies. But as an area, we are far more powerful than we can be as a single congregation. So the Greater Northwest Tongan Relief Fund will help pay for shipments of supplies to Tonga, but there will also be money kept in reserve for volunteer and mission teams so that when it is safe and appropriate for volunteers to go to Tonga to help with the rebuilding, we have money in order to be able to send them. During uh, the closing session yesterday, the treasurer was making a report on this, and he said, so far during annual conference, we've donated just over $5,000 to this effort, and I encourage you to continue donations. And by the time he got to the end of that sentence he said we are now approaching eight thousand dollars please take this back to your congregations and encourage people to give and by the time his report was over we had hit ten thousand dollars we are always stronger together and can make a bigger impact when all of us pool our funds. And so if you do want to make a donation to the Greater Northwest Tongan Relief, you are welcome to do that. You can just write Tonga on your check or on your offering envelope, and uh, we will make sure that it goes into that fund. This is going to be an ongoing effort, so if it's not something that you want to do today, you don't need to do that. This will be ongoing, and uh, we'll put the links in the newsletter as well where you can donate directly to the fund online. I do appreciate all of your continuing generosity. Uh, if you are here in person and you want to make a donation, the offering box is in the back, and uh, Princess Pig is up here at my feet. This is where we collect change for change. If you have spare change that you'd like to give, we use those funds to support school children in Nicaragua. If you are worshiping online, you can see our website is linked down below where you can make an online donation or you can send a check to the street address on the screen. Will you all please bow with me as we offer ourselves and our gifts to God. Creator God, accept, bless, and multiply all of our many gifts for the glory of your kingdom here on earth, the abundant life of all your people, and the thriving of your good creation. Amen. Will you please stand as you're able for our closing song. This is another annual conference standard. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. This is the very first song in the hymnal, I think. So it's labeled page 57. Yep, it's the very first one, uh, number 57. And the words will be on the screen. Um, so listen up. We're going to sing verses 1, 2, Three, seven. Okay? One, two, three, seven. I invite you to receive these words of benediction. Again, this was a benediction given at one of our worship services this week. So know that uh, your siblings in faith throughout the greater Northwest also receive this blessing. 
May God speak a word to us now as at creation. I called you to life. I see you. You are mine. You are good. It is all very good. May God's Holy Spirit hold your head above the troubled waters and keep you from being swept away when you almost let go. And when the way ahead seems rocky, twisted, forked, narrow, may Jesus Christ follow and find you in your weariness and wandering and return you always to the way of life. Amen.